through a survey called the My World Survey, we captured around 10 million people's voices and brought those to world leaders to tell them the issues that mattered to people the most in terms of putting them on the agenda. Now that we have the SDGs, we are also working to ensure that those people's voices are still listened to throughout the process of implementation of the SDGs from now until 2030 so that governments understand the priorities of citizens, but also that governments are listening. Citizens, private sector, all stakeholders, academia, these are all sources of solutions to the SDGs and to climate change. And here we are today to talk about how partners and non-governmental partners and stakeholders can have a role in that implementation of the SDGs as a source of solutions and how the governments can empower people to take action for the SDGs. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to introduce our, our panel here today. And what we'll do is we'll, just to tell you the format, we'll let each person introduce themselves briefly and tell you a little bit about their work and then we'll engage in some interactive discussion about um, how their work is supporting and contributing to citizen engagement in the SDGs. So first I'd like to call upon Jamie Irvin, who's the manager of the Equator Initiative. And I'll ask Jamie to introduce herself briefly and tell you a little bit about her work. Oh, thanks, she needs a microphone, thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, my name is Jamie Irvin, and I'm manager of the Equator Initiative, and I also manage our Nature for Development program. The SDGs have two primary precepts embedded in them. The first is that in our endeavors to achieve the SDGs, we will leave no one behind. We need to start with the bottom first. And the second are that the SDGs are indivisible. We cannot achieve one without achieving the other. Let me just share two facts about our world. The first is that while we have, almost, we have reduced poverty from 80% at the turn of the century to less than 10% today, only 750 million people are in extreme poverty versus 80% uh, at the turn of the century, we have done so at the expense of the environment. We've lost more than 50% of populations of over 3,000 plants and animals since 1970. We have achieved development at the expense of the environment. And the second has to do with inequity. If the world were a village of 100 people, one person would own more than half the village. Therefore, we need inclusive nature-based solutions to the sustainable development goals. For 15 years, the Equator Initiative has identified nature-based solutions around the world that communities and indigenous groups are taking for achieving the sustainable development goals. But as we look to the next 13 years, to 2030, we know that we'll have an increase in demand of 35% for food, of 45% for water, and 50% for energy. And half the world's infrastructure has yet to be developed. Imagine every house and road and double it in the next 13 years, something like $2.4 trillion alone in the next three years in infrastructure, which means that we will continue to see roughly 50,000 species disappear every year. Therefore, more than ever, we need solutions that are just and inclusive and tackle the problems that we have of decoupling economic growth with environmental degradation. Thank you very much. Now, the Equator Initiative is this produces some of the most inspiring examples, identifies some of the most inspiring examples of local action, bringing in social issues and environmental issues into the same project and uh, in triple win solutions for everyone. Now, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about how some of these solutions are not only effectively identified, but some interesting, inspiring examples of how they've been scaled up by governments. Because I think the, the scaling up is often the challenge. There are people taking interesting actions all over the world, but identifying and scaling up. Can you tell us a little more? This keeps me awake every <laughs> night. <laughs> I think, first of all, identifying solutions. We use the Equator Prize 
which brings together the UN, communities, celebrities, governments, storytellers, storytellers, media, to identify and celebrate excellence. But often identifying the solutions means looking to existing traditions. For example, one of the first Equator Prize winners in 2002 was in Fiji, and it was recognizing uh, locally managed marine area practices that built on traditional taboo practices that were in place for hundreds, even thousands of years. Looking to the past, the community was able to build a new tradition of locally managed marine areas. At the time, 15 years ago, this seemed amazing and, and, uh, and a, a huge departure from the norm. But now in Fiji, that solution has scaled across the country. It's scaled across the Pacific. And this year, we aw awarded the, uh, the first locally managed marine area in Kenya, jumped the ocean. This is an example of an, how an idea that seems uh, boutique and artisanal at the time can spread to have a much bigger impact. In terms of scaling, we see three pathways. The first is through policy for identifying examples of policies that can be scaled up. And let me just give you one example. In Thailand, a community uh, preserved its 152 hectare mangrove forest. And you think, well, that's, that's not so big, that's not so important. But the tsunami that came through protected that village and that village alone from disaster. And so how can we scale up this kind of solution uh, as a policy? The second example is in capacity. One of the winners this year is in the local homestay association of the Indi uh, Indonesia Raja Ampat villages. 18 villages learning together how to create a platform for nature-based ecotourism that starts with indigenous communities and empowers them first and helps them manage nature so that they can have a sustainable basis for tourism. So the policy and capacity. And the third, and perhaps the most powerful, is through finance. And if we take uh, an example this year from Kenya of one of the winners called Mikoka Pomoja. This is means mangroves together, and they are the world's first blue carbon credits. They're receiving money from blue carbon credits to restore their mangroves and to achieve sustainable development within their communities. So together, I think policy, capacity, and finance are the three pathways we see to scale up inclusive nature-based solutions. Thank you very much. It's, it's a fascinating area. I think that um, talking about traditional solutions, we, we're here to talk about innovative leadership. And I think that when it comes to leadership, there's, there's been a tendency in the past to think that solutions need to come from experts. And I, I think that this is, we're all changing to some extent in this regard. Slowly, slowly, we're understanding that solutions come from everywhere. And and particularly from history, as you said. I mean, some of these solutions were developed over thousands of years. Sorry. <laughs> some of the solutions were developed over thousands of years for a good reason, because they're based upon community lessons which have been passed down. Now there's a lot of knowledge there that we can tap into. Um, and so I think that when it comes to leadership, and even ourselves, we're trying to change the way that we speak. We, we don't talk about expert panels to the same extent that we used to, because we talk about practices, pra areas of practice and experience, because good practice can come from all directions. Now, when it comes to scale, <laughs> I think that that brings us to our next guest, um, because we have <coughs> Alex Wang from China, and uh, from the Secretary General of Youth Think Center China. And what we we work with the Youth Think Center China on the topic of trying to engage millions, because they're there. That really is the challenge. I'll let you introduce yourself, please, Alex. Definitely. Thanks very much, Laura, and uh, so happy uh, to be here. Such a beautiful, uh, like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a venue in the COP23. Um, so there are a few things we are doing in China, uh, and uh, the, um, I think in China we are <coughs> trying to, uh, so we are, uh, sorry, so, uh, so we are trying to, uh, 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 engage uh, uh, Chinese young people on different topics like um, um, uh, global goals, uh, climate change, and also social business. Um, so there are a few things we are doing like uh, uh, to make sure that we can do our work. Uh, they're probably better. So number one is that we work with Laura and uh, on OSIS uh, project on my world. We are trying to bring my world uh, 
for this global campaign uh, uh, to China because I'm thinking that um, um, the problem in China there is many traditional projects. I mean, it's uh, 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 but we need uh, some projects like my work. Like we tell the people that doing all this work are really cool, and so we can engage more people. Uh, through uh, Chinese social medias. Um, so number two is that so we have some projects to support uh, <coughs> local uh, social entrepreneurs, like we call Think Big, uh, founded by uh, Chengmei Charity Foundation. We get uh, more than 2,300 uh, uh, projects in the past four years, uh, all of them from uh, all of China, from the rural areas, from the cities. And so for all these projects, uh, they're working on different topics. So um, they are working on ground. Um, we are thinking that uh, there is many global topics, but how can we make sure that once we have global policies, all this uh, global policy can be delivered by social entrepreneurs? And prof uh, Professor Yunus said that if we can link young people, social business, and high tech together, if we can mobilize all these young people on all these um, sustainable goals, even we can achieve uh, sustainable goals earlier than 2030. So uh, our belief is that um, we can definitely bring all this uh, global concept to China for link to localize sustainable goals. So um, uh, we also get someone to come here um, to see that um, there is uh, um, many people around the world are caring about climate change, are caring about uh, um, uh, some community work. Uh, so number three is that uh, we, uh, we bring all these social entrepreneurs, the people, the young people working on ground in China to the global plenary, like uh, to the global festival of actions um, next year in, in Bonn, like uh, climate change, like general assembly. We want to make sure that even some social entrepreneurs here don't speak English, but we want to make sure that we translate to, to them. We, 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 so we want to uh, empower them that they don't feel alone. They are, they are actually changing the world so through working on the ground. Um, so this is our three things we are working uh, in China, but also um, together with UN and also like um, Professor Yunus and also others. So uh, we are definitely looking forward to working more um, to link all this global community to China because I think uh, for many uh, campaigns, they probably promote uh, on Facebook and so on Twitter, all these um, social medias, but in China, we're using different uh, social platforms. So this is why uh, we are so exciting that uh, to work together to bring all this globe back, but we uh, try to localize all these global projects into uh, Chinese local community. And also we bring some, lo uh, uh, some local innovation back to the global plenary. Hopefully we can do, like uh, to uh, copy to other countries as well. That's it. Thank you very much. You can hang on to that. Um, absolutely. So I mean, you've raised a few uh, very critical points there. Are obviously translation being key to leaving no one behind. And here we are speaking English in an international conference, as we do, which happens to be my first language and makes it easy for me, but, uh, but for a lot of people that's still a challenge. And so one of the things, translation is the, the very minimum we need to do, but also sometimes it's more than that. It's not just the words, it's really being able to explain concepts in another language. And we have to do that through partnership. We have to do that through building building bridges and we we ourselves need to build bridges with partners within countries that we we can't even use our, our social platforms in China we have to recreate them in China there's a there's still in many ways a big wall around a billion people in China so we need to build these bridges to strengthen the connections and ensure that we are reaching everybody and in particular empowering youth as part of this journey to the SDGs um, now Alex I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some innovative leadership examples that you've seen among youth and, and through your work with Youth Think China, and, and if you'd like to introduce some sure, definitely. Of I that. think the best way to talk about uh, some stories is uh, taught by themselves. I mean, uh, we bring one uh, local innovator from uh, from China, like um, I will translate it for her, like uh, she had been working in Zibo, there is a, a city in Shandong province, um, um, in China, like for 15 years, on um, uh, innovative uh, Thank you. education on environment. Yeah. Yeah? It's our pleasure to welcome Li Baobao to the stage. Thank you for joining us. So I can help uh, Baobao to translate. Uh, 大家好, 我来自中国, 
呃，刚才大家已经知道了我的家乡的名字淄博，非常美丽的一个地方。那这个地方呢 ？My name is Li Baba. I come from Zhibo, uh, a very beautiful small town in China, in Shandong Province. 好，有这样几个形容词来形容它。它是齐国的古都，聊斋的故里，陶瓷的名城啊，陶瓷名城，还是蹴鞠的故乡。It's very hard to translate. <laughs> But actually, Zibo is, uh, you know, like a thousand years ago, it's the capital of uh, uh, Qi country. It's like, um, I think, more than uh, two thousand years ago. Or uh, yeah, two, more than two thousand years ago. It's many like small countries in, I mean, it's not uh, in China, but they, they have th like uh, different kings, right? So. Uh, and also, actually, Zibo is the hometown for soccer. I'm not sure you know that, but uh, it's like Chinese soccer, but it's the same concept with uh, uh, current soccer. But uh, some years ago, they play different. They, uh, uh, and also, it's um, also very famous for, um, uh, for different um, uh, artwork, all this uh, stuff. So it's a historical um, town in China. 但是在我小时候啊，一推开窗户看到的就是一个煤干石堆，就是燃烧的这个煤炭，然后剩下的这个煤堆，然后呃，刮风下雨，呃，都会伴随着这个呃空气，然后雾霾哈，带来了一些环境的一些污染。But when I grew up, when I opened the windows, I found that uh, there's a burning dirty coal um, there, and also the air is. Uh, also polluted, um, so this is uh, somehow like um, I feel um, during my grow up. So. 好，那我们很多的市民呢，为了让自己有更好的生活，他们努力赚钱，然后搬到海边去，因为海边的空气好，环境好，甚至有的会移民到国外去。那我就想，我们淄博市有四百六十万人，是不是所有人都要离开自己的家乡呢？嗯、um,。So many citizens in Zibo, like, they try and work very hard to make money, and then they can move to the seaside, because in seaside, they have a uh, 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 better air and uh, better environment. Uh, even some rich people move to move to uh, um, to US or to Europe. Uh, um, so I'm thinking that there is uh, more than 4 million citizens in my city. In my city, it's, uh, 4 million is a small city in China. <laughs> I mean, so, is this for me uh, all moving out? Ah, so, in my 20 years ago, that is 15 years ago, I started to do a thing. I invited my friend, we took five trees. From that time, I started a community organization called Blue Sky. So, when I was 20 years old, like 50 years ago, uh, so you know her age now. <laughs> And um, uh, together with my friends, uh, we plant uh, five small trees here. We start uh, an NGO called uh, uh, Green uh, Ribbon, right? Yeah. Uh, this 15 years, we have been working on four fronts. The first is to take our land, take our land, so in the past 15 years, we have working a uh, few projects. There is one project is that there is uh, uh, many um, uh, uh, like mountains like who are um, like work for the coal uh, mining or or, uh, or other mining, so um, like uh, I mean, they take uh, 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 resources, and then they are trying to plant the trees here. So their goal is a five million tree, because every citizen in the city plant one tree, so to green uh, the mountains. 但是，仅仅在地面上种树是不够的，更重要的是在心里种下一棵树。所以，我们的愿景就是在人人的心中种下公益常青树。Um, so I think it's not enough that we just, uh, uh, you know, uh, plant trees in physically. I mean, um, but it's more important you plant the trees in your heart. 
通过植树，我们带动了很多的市民志愿者，他们喜呃带着自己的小朋友，甚至是八九十岁的老人一起参与进来。他们因为植树这件事情，感觉到自己能够为自己的家乡环境改善做出了一定的努力，非常非常的骄傲和自豪。Through these projects, uh, I mean, just find and trace, like uh, the people bring their families to come together, their kids, uh, 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 their grandparents who come. So, like, uh, 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 during uh, planting trees, uh, they feel that uh, they can contribute a little to the environment in the local city. So, this is a free and open city of the world has become a national city and city. 城市，我们的森林保护面积啊，已经达到了百分之四十六以上，呃，覆盖率。So in the past f i f t e years, through all the uh, citizen engagement, now the city has become green again, and uh, the cover, um, I think the coverage of the uh, uh, forest, I mean the trees, are forty-six、uh, percent of the city now. 啊，那最后呢，我们是希望每个人能够持续的。呃，开展我们对家乡的这样的一个保护以及可持续发展，所以就要植树育人。我们希望更多的青年人，呃，能够从他上学时期一直到他工作，最后还能够退休之后，也能参与到我们的绿色行动当中，为我们的城市呃变得更好而做出努力。所以到现在，在淄博有一句话就是 ，Welcome to 淄博。Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, now we think that plant trees is the first stage. The next day, uh, uh, the next day is that uh, we need to make sure that you have uh, uh, young talents who will keep uh, such a small way. And uh, uh, so now uh, they have a slogan like uh, "Welcome to Zibo," but it means that uh, come to live in Zibo. I mean, before 50 years ago, it's a polluted city, but now it's become green. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Alex, for the interpretation. It's an inspiring example to see how really when you can tap in and engage millions of people, you can make very meaningful, tangible impact. And it's not just the planting of trees that makes the impact, which is green, the city, which has transformed a city and the environment for people. The simple act of engaging people in the tr planting of trees creates this feeling of empowerment among citizens that they can take action, they can involve themselves in changing their environment. They don't just complain about what the government's doing anymore. Individual citizens can take action, change their own future, and then once they've taken action once, they're much more likely to take action again and to get involved again. And, th and so that brings us to um, our next speaker on the topic of youth empowerment, youth engagement. We have. Kikashu Basu, who is the youth ambassador from the World Future Council and the founder and president of Green Hope Foundation. Welcome. Thank you so much. So, like Laura said, my name is Kakasha. I am 17 years old and I'm the youth ambassador of World Future Council and I run my own youth organization, Green Hope Foundation, whose main objective is to empower young people in the sustainable development agenda. So my green journey began when I was eight years old. But when I was 12, I was one of the youngest delegates at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. And there were over 50,000 delegates present there, but only a handful of children. And I did not like that because the outcome document was called the future we want, but then you only had like a few children over there. So when I returned to Dubai, I founded Green Hope so that young children and young people all around the world could come together to learn about these environmental and sustainability challenges and then also learn how to take actions to mitigate them. So we turned five this year and we work uh, on two things, so ground level projects and then our awareness spreading and raising. So our ground level projects are held pretty much every week and we work on mangrove conservation projects, tree planting, recycling campaigns, and 
uh, a lot of other different things that all relate to the sustain 17 sustainable development goals. We also conduct workshops, conferences, and academies, which are tailor-made, ranging from two-hour sessions to full-day events, where children and young people all around the world learn about uh, the different issues of the world, and then they come together to uh, come up with innovative solutions. And the, we don't just talk at them or just talk to them, and they just talk to us as well. We use creative ways such as music, art, dance, drama, writing, sports to spread awareness. Because like Alex and Laura uh, were saying about the language, we all have also faced a language barrier when we've gone to India or Nepal. But then when we start using music and art to uh, communicate with them, that barrier is like you totally overcome it. And then the communication is way better than if you're, you know, you're just speaking to each other. So this is a fun and innovative way for, I believe, young people and everyone else around the world to communicate. And what started off as an initiative of a 12-year-old has now gone to 10 countries and we have over a thousand members worldwide. So uh, that is Green Hope Foundation and we are extremely glad that we've been able to mobilize so many people around the world and we hope to do much more. And it's not just young people, it's corporates, governments, uh, other sectors of civil society, private sector, everyone, because we believe that together we can and we will achieve a sustainable future. Tremendous. Congratulations for the tremendous success. Such an it's such an inspiration to meet you and have you here with us. Um, can you tell us what are some of the ways that you find decision makers are actually incorporating some of this youth, some of this energy, but also perspectives of youth? And have you seen any examples of innovative leadership in your work so far? Okay, so uh, the innovative leadership part is like the example. I'll give the example of Green Hope and how we've used uh, music and other creative ways to spread awareness. So when once we like start talking to them or like communicating in other creative ways, they take the message back and they start uh, changing their own lives. And I think that is the first step towards becoming a leader or an innovative leader because you change yourself and then you spread that awareness. And uh, well, we, there are more than two billion uh, children around the world and every one of them deserves to have a voice. So one, another example is uh, I spoke to these six year olds at a junior school in Toronto and they told me all about pollution, about the biodiversity conservation, about and why we should take care of the environment. And one girl said that if we do something nice for the environment, the environment will do something nice for us. And I think that's a really simple way of saying that, you know, we should protect our environment because if we don't, it's gonna retaliate. So I think that is also an excellent example of saying that leadership comes in all forms, as you said uh, before. It doesn't matter uh, how old you are or where you're from. You can just start by doing it yourself and then spreading that awareness. And in terms of decision makers, I would like to give the example of um, the United Arab Emirates, in uh, particular Dubai, where I was born and raised. So I consider myself extremely lucky to have such an amazing government who's uh, where the Dubai municipality, the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment make sure that young people are involved in all their activities. So it's actually, they're the ones who like go to schools, approach them and ask them to be a part of their initiatives and tell them that, okay, this is how we can work together. So I think that is an excellent example of civil society and the government and the private sectors all working together to achieve a sustainable world. And now you can actually see benefits of everyone's work there because I, a lot of people think that, oh, Dubai, so that's just, uh, they don't automatically associate green with that. But once you actually come there, you can see that, okay, it is so green and you've actually turned a desert into an oasis. And we now have natural rains and it's super involved in the whole sustainable development process. 
And I think it's only be a, one of the main things is because the government, private sector, civil society, the decision makers, and the young people have all worked together to create this uh, paradise. Thank you very much. Well, it, it certainly is the case that sometimes these very simple, wise words of children in any of these processes can be the ones that just stop us in our tracks and say, you know what, they're, they're right. And we, this is what we need to prioritize, they're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Well, I think that that also brings us to our, our next speaker because I th here we have, we've been saving, in a way, saving for last the role of governments in all of this um, to speak about how we're, we've been talking about innovative leadership and, and trying to find examples of when governments have come in. And now we're looking to the government for perspectives in terms of how there have been some successes in, in bringing in local voices and citizen action, but also how governments are incentivizing each other and uh, incentivizing non-state actors to be part of the solution for the SDGs. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mas Frederick fischer Moller, a senior advisor from the Nordic Council of Ministers. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for for having me in this uh, great discussion with all of you guys. I'm, as you said, Mass Fischer-Möller, Nordic Council of Ministers. The Nordic Council of Ministers is the official government, intergovernmental body between the, all the governments of Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and Finland. So us small countries up in the north of Europe, we try to cooperate and coordinate as much as possible on many agendas and, of course, also on the Sustainable Development Goals agenda. And uh, as you said, we've had, I don't know if we've had any success on this yet, but we have at least a very successful start in saying how do we work with sustainable development goals in the Nordic Council of Ministers, in the Nordic Corporation. Us, the bureaucrats, we of course suggested how do we work with this in the Nordics. We said, could we have two experts from each country sit around a table and discuss how to pro move forward. And then uh, the ministers of the Nordic country said, no, we want to disrupt this. We want to change things. We want to do something different. We want to give a voice. So it's not only bureaucrats and no kids. So they have uh, added two youth representatives with no government experience, no national commitment, no nothing. They're only committed to the future. And their role in the Nordic Corporation on Sustainable Development Goals and delivering on the sustainable development goals is to ask the tough questions, make sure that the politicians or the bureaucrats don't give a political or a bureaucratic answer, but give a real answer to the questions like, why aren't we taking care of the world and is it going to retaliate and should we do something more? So that's going to be a very interesting start, starting point for the Nordic cooperation on how to deliver on the sustainable development goals. Tremendous. Now, uh, so within your own work, um, can you think of any any of these examples of innovative leadership from your work specifically, where the government is integrating non-state actor voices into the work? Yeah, we have a uh, in the Nordic uh, Council of Ministers. In in as you can say, we have three uh, overarching principles that have to go through all cooperation, whether it's on food security or it's on infrastructure, or it's on energy, and it's uh, is we have to make sure we have to take into account sustainable development goals, we have to take into account uh, uh, women's rights and, and equality between the genders, gender equality, and we have to take into account uh, youth and youth voices. So in all projects, whenever we start anything of cooperation between the Nordic governments, we have to think about, oh, should we rem remember ourselves to integrate some youth voices in this? And not just show youth how it's not about this is for the youth this is not just with the youth it's by the youth so it's children and youth try to bring them into the a little bit into the engine of uh, of, uh, of government action and try to see okay what can a youth voice be in this and sometimes the answer is okay a youth voice perhaps isn't the most suited for exactly this project but we have to think about it every time we start a project and that's quite good and uh, also, of course, we have uh, quite some success in linking government, civil society actors, and uh, businesses on tackling sustainable development uh, issues. Uh, we see that as a, as, a, as a way forward. I'm an expert on food policy, sustainable food policy, and we see that almost all of our most successful achievements over the past 10 to 15 years have been in cooperation between government, civil society, 
and businesses, making sure that if we come up with a solution, it's a solution that is also interesting for the businesses to work with. So we have to make, it's very, very tough and it's very, very hard. And sometimes we progress a little bit slower, but then on the other hand, the progress is more sustainable. We don't make a law banning food waste, but we make partnerships making sure that all the retailers feel themselves responsible for limiting food waste. We have civil society organizations. Usually they, they used to yell at the retailers. Now they are instead highlighting the ones who are doing a good job. And government is then facilitating with the right kind of numbers, the right kind of incentives, and listening when they hear, okay, we have trouble with food law. Could you do something about this and that so we can all handle food waste together? Yes, we can. And uh, if you're interested, you can come tomorrow and listen more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we've had some fascinating perspectives from, from different parts of the different sides of the coin, really, all the way from youth to uh, international organization of governments. Uh, so I think what might be interesting now is to, to have a little look at what are some of the lessons coming out of this. I mean, we think we, we see that it's important to engage everybody in implementing the SDGs. We've seen that the solutions can come from anywhere. But I think it's easy for us to forget, sitting in this room, surrounded by people who are very active on these topics, and myself, I've spent years of experience at the United Nations, but I still get this moment where when I go to explain my work to my family or I go out onto the street to the general public, the level of awareness of some of these issues is really quite low, and certainly the the level of engagement is low, and people's idea that they even have any any part in the solution. Uh, how do we tap into those those millions out there? I mean, really, how do we how do we get everybody involved in this in the solutions in learning about the opportunities to engage officially, in learning about the opportunities to engage locally? Um, what are some of the lessons that you've seen in your work? I'm going to open this up to the panel. Um, we still have two mics. Uh, do you want to do you want to take that first? Yeah. Do you want to go first? If I if I may just continue when I have the word in this. <laughs> no, but uh, I think what I'm I find I I've, I've been working with sustainable food production and sustainable food systems for a while, and it has been tough to get this talk going. But now, just in the past eight ten months, I've seen a change. Suddenly, both governments and businesses are starting to refer to the Sustainable Development Goals as our common framework for sustainable future. And it's just so hugely encouraging for someone like me who has been pushing these issues and found a lot of resistance. Of course, we still find resistance, but when large municipalities in the Nordic countries start to order their, their, their finances, not on, on, on the levels they used to, but like streamlining them through uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the Norwegian government just have uh, 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 writing as much about the uh, Norwegian economy as they are about how Norway delivers on the sustainable goals in their yearly finance report. That kind of bringing it close into everyday work of what we already did, that's, uh, that's quite something. And uh, I also see in civil society more and more people that knows about uh, sustainable development goals and we just have to push and push and push and say this is our common agenda everybody is going to follow this anyway let's just uh, stick to that one instead of finding our own so of course we've uh, also in my capacity as a, a, a food advisor we've also had a new strategy and it's of course starts with the sustainable development goals it even it's though it's a nordic strategy on food policy so that's at least a governmental approach to how we can all engage yeah, I, I I totally agree with what you said, especially with the everyday life thing. Is I think a lot of people still think that okay to move to a sustainable life, we have to like turn our whole life upside down, and we can't do this, you can't do that. But I think that it's just making the s like the smallest changes that like after some time it'll just come unconsciously to you like okay turning off the tap uh when you're not uh, li when you're brushing your teeth or like turning off the electrical devices when you're not in the room so i think that once we get to spread that message pe people will be a lot more receptive because they're like okay so this is these are just the smallest things i can do and i think it's also important to say that those small things can actually make the difference because every drop makes an ocean. 
So that is uh, something that I just wanted to say. And another thing is that um, we use social media to spread awareness, especially amongst the young people. And I think once you reach out to the children and young people, you it's like a domino effect, but in a good way. So you go on to their parents, to their friends, families, and eventually you reach out to everyone else. And if you can't reach out to someone with social media, the good way domino effect still applies because from one person it goes to the other person and that way we can spread that awareness. And I'm a very positive person and I really believe that it can be done, but only if every single one of us takes that step outside of our comfort zones to like go to someone and uh, give them this small bit of info that, okay, you can do something to help out our planet. Thank you. Um, I think that it's true that um, the Sustainable Development Goals have really been a transformation. And even from my, my own perspective, from work at the United Nations and years, you know, initially working under the Millennium Development Goals, it really has changed the way that that we've engaged across governments, across sectors of society. I, I think that even for the United Nations, for the first time, we're working together in a way that we never did before. You know, we recognize it really is a shared agenda and it is creating this space for us to build bridges that we didn't have before. So I think, Ali. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I mean, two points. I, I think the first one is that technology. Uh, I just want to share with you an app we use in China. I think very interesting. I talk with friends here. We know that Uber are sharing the cars, and uh, you know Airbnb is a sharing house. Now we have uh, in, in China we have an app. Um, they don't have English name now, but the meaning is Chinese is uh, go back home to eat. But it's right like you, you, this one share your kitchen and share your food. Like you can search nearby. Like uh, I know. Probably Marta is uh, good at uh, cooking Spanish food, and yesterday he got uh, extra food, right? Today I can share here, and then I don't want to eat uh, in the cafeteria. I think it's uh, too boring and uh, nothing. I, I want to, I think, oh, Marta House is nearby, and I want to get Spanish food. And this is somehow, you know, you share your resources. I think this kind of technology is very, very important. And also we, ho we also have many other innovative apps, I mean, in terms of mobile internet, we're so proud that in China we have many interesting things happen. We have our um, uh, Think Big Fellow. We also support him in the, five, uh, in the past years. He has the app is that um, you play online games. It's very funny games. It's not like a game or, or, or you call your mom every day. It's like a task, right? You, you, uh, you will work for 10 minutes every day and you get uh, your points, like uh, credits. And then there's uh, charity projects, maybe focus on different SDG goals. You choose one. And then you donate your credits to that one, and then the companies will donate at the same time. I mean, you donate 10 points, the company will donate $1, something like that. So this one, this, this simple app connecting the general public, like young people who like games, and also the companies who want to raise public awareness. I mean, they are bringing a lot of money on media, but through this app, they can also, they can track that there's a 10 some people like uh, donate uh, credits to, to, I mean, planting trees. I think this is a technology, I mean, very, very important. The second point is that um, I think cross-sector um, partnership are very important. It's like today, we have um, people from UN, we have uh, people from government, uh, people from society. I mean, to be honest, I think um, in many countries, the people in the general public look at international organizations or government or UN, it's like looking, they are on the sky. We feel that way, right? So they don't feel that the UN is sitting beside me and talking, talking with us. I think the best way is that we should bring different sectors together. So in the past two days, we bring our Chinese, uh, you know, like a social media person here. She has, uh, she has uh, three million followers in China. She never know about SDGs before. She never know about climate change. I, I mean, she, she definitely we hear about climate change. Uh, every day on the TV news, right? But if you ask people, what is Paris Agreement? What is the climate change? They say, we hear about this, but we don't know that what is uh, the goal for two degrees somehow. But we bring her to here, and we have a conversation with a campaign, we have a conversation with others. And then she feels that, okay, this topic is so close to me. And then for yesterday, when we were in campaign center, she approached us that, because normally, they, for this kind of celebrity, they sell their, uh, uh, social media promotion, right? It's like a 
So tell me, we can talk with more celebrities in China, ask them to choose different SDG goals. And then we can use the uh, humans of my world's stories. They will share their stories. And then they said that uh, it's very easy for us like, uh, to reach a million people because at least they have three million like fans there. So I think uh, many NGOs, even UN, we, we are thinking that we're trying very hard that to reach many people. But I mean, through this cross-sector partnership, we bring everyone, we feel that UN a government are sitting beside you. And then, and then we're working together. And then they think that, oh, this topic is not too far from me. And then I can, I can work on something. Like if I have three million fans online, so I can share some good news with them, like ask them to take action. I think this is a cross sector. I mean, this kind of dialogue is very, very important. And also this kind of partnership follow up are very important to make sure that we can engage everyone in local level. So I think there are uh, three lessons that I've observed. And the first is that solutions do exist. And we need to start flipping from thinking that we collectively need to create solutions. Yes, we do. But we need to also find solutions that exist to recognize them, to celebrate them, and to scale them up through policy, through capacity, and through finance. And to do that, we need to become better listeners and better storytellers. Uh, secondly, we're learning that solutions can be scaled. Solutions at a local level in one country and one community can be applied in different countries in different areas. And third, by aligning around the SDGs, we can have much more impact. We think about the Global Impact Investment Network that looks at $100 million in impact investing, they're aligning around SDGs. And if we as a global community can ar ar align ourselves around the SDGs that we're most in affiliation with, we can have much more impact together. Thank you very much. So I think that we've seen that um, citizen engagement can be incentivized from all directions, from other young people, it could come from government. We also talked about how technology and private sector have a very important role in incentivizing that. And of course, celebrities as part of the uh, bringing, bringing the communications angle into everything that we do. And so I think that, um, I think that we all agree that, that it really is a joint effort and that we need to create more of these spaces um, in UN conferences, but in also in everyday life where we can bring different sectors together to, to recognize the wisdom in, in each other's solutions and, and really to scale up the solutions. Now, on the topic of listening, I think just as a, as a closure for this event, I'm just gonna introduce you very quickly to one of the tools that we at the SDG Action Campaign use for listening. It's the one I, I mentioned at the very beginning, the My World Survey. As part of the global conversation, we asked people around the world, almost 10 million people, to tell us what their priorities were going into the negotiation of the SDGs. And they told us, uh, and uh, at the time, the, the top priorities were a good education and good health, and, and we asked people really what's important for you and your family. Um, now, we've, as after the SDGs were, were announced, we also felt that it was important to keep listening. And so we've launched the 2030 version of the survey, My World 2030, and now we're asking people three questions in this new survey. And what we're going to do here is we're gonna ask all of you to take the survey, if you would, to become part of this global community of people who are telling us what they think about the sustainable development goals. Now this time, we're not just asking for priorities, we're also asking, first of all, awareness, because we want to be able to track our, our own efforts to raise awareness of the SDGs. We're also asking about your priorities and about progress, because we really want to help governments and everyone to be able to track how we're doing from now until 2030 on the SDGs. So I think, um, oh, Guyane's gonna, okay, I'll open it for you, Guyane's helping, thank you. Um, so if everybody could just take a moment as part of the closing of this event to, to share your voice with us. And, and if you could, if you have your phones on you or your computers and you're connected, please go to myworld2030.org and just take a moment to, to add your voice to this global survey. I'll give you a moment to get your devices out. So as you can see here, the first question, number one, is are you aware of the sustainable development goals? I'm gonna guess that most of the people in the room are going to answer yes to that one. But then this one's a tough one. Which six of the following goals are of immediate concern 
to you and your family. I recognize this might change if you do it on a different day or maybe after you've just lived through a natural disaster or, <laughs> I mean, your, your perspective can change, but, but the idea here it really is that we want to be able to send clear messages through to government about how priorities are changing. Here today, we might have quite a few people voting for partnerships as one of the key messages of this event today. And let's select, all right, so here are my six for today. Now, the third question is, how would you say the situation on your chosen goal has Got, has it gotten better, stayed the same, or gotten worse over the past 12 months? And I'll give you a moment just to respond to that. I'm feeling optimistic today. After you select your six, we take you to a, a space where you can fill in some of the basic demographic information about yourself. Now, just to emphasize that this is an anonymous survey, but we capture this information here to, um, in order to, oops, I didn't select my age. Do I have to um, publicly announce my age? It's all right, I'm not shy. <laughs> and we capture this information so that we can tell governments and tell leaders how different demographic groups feel about the SDGs and maybe if there are priority areas to one particular demographic group. And we've been doing this for a long time. Um, as I said, we started with the 2013 survey. After you submit, you have the opportunity to leave your email. And there that is, um, the email is not associated with your vote. The email is just to join our, our mailing list of, of, so you can stay informed about the campaign and some of the actions that people are taking globally around the world to raise awareness about sustainable development goals, but also to really build this dialogue between governments and civil society. Um, now that you've taken the survey, I'll quickly show you the results here. These are the results so far from the My World 2030 survey, I think we have around 38,000 results in the system right now. There's a really interesting story happening with these results. As I mentioned, that we had almost 10 million people vote in the first round of the survey. Now with 38,000 results, we've seen one really big change, which I think is gonna be of interest to people here. And that is on climate change. Oops, let's click that again. Um, in the 2015 version of the survey, action taken on climate change was last, came in last out of 16 different priorities. Here today, out of 38,000 votes, we're seeing climate changes coming in here, number four. And this is a survey of general public. Most of these votes actually have come in from Mexico. Um, as it happens through a, part, a very active partner in Mexico. So I just wanted to show you that uh, as we talked about, I mean, people are getting on board with the agenda. People are understanding some of the changes that need to happen. And I think that this also emphasizes that they understand that the challenges are beyond their own personal lives, that the action needs to happen outside of their own sphere. Because in, in the first round, we had quality education, we had um, good health, very personal issues but we see that people are over time getting more engaged in the environmental agenda. And this is inspiring for us, but more importantly, we, we also are using this data now everywhere we go, here in UN Fora, but we're also empowering citizens to also take this data and approach their governments and tell them that these are the priorities of citizens or that young women in your community are, are feeling that they're not being heard sufficiently. And so this, this survey can be a very powerful tool to engage it's a very simple tool that anybody can take up if they want to start raising awareness about the SDGs, but also to engage um, their, their local community and then also to engage their local government, maybe their national government. If they can get enough of a movement going, uh, that's, and that's the objective here with the My World Survey. Anybody here can become a partner if you'd like to. I'm sorry, I just have to do my little, my little promo for, for you to join us um, in the SDG Action Campaign. Um, now, I think 
uh, just a, a few words of closing. I'd like to um, provide a little little present to our speakers. This is a, a book which captures one of the other programs of the SDG Action Campaign, which is about communicating stories. And this is from our Humans of My World campaign. These are stories of youth taking action around the world, but they're, these are captu capturing stories of ordinary people and some of the hardships or challenges they endure in their daily lives. Um, this is part of a series, the Humans of My World series, and the purpose of this, this series is really to build empathy and understanding between ordinary people and government about what the real challenges are that are out there, and, and I'll give one also to Bapa. Thank you very much. Um, and just to say a final word of thanks to all of our participants, it's really been inspiring to have you here, and um, we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you. We're all about partnerships, so um, we'd like to carry on. And if any of you here would like to talk to us afterwards, I think, uh, well, I have a few moments, but please feel free to come up and introduce yourselves. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, group picture. Hello, everybody. Just a short announcement. There's going to be. <laughs> Hello. Oops. I moved up. Okay, sorry. Um, there's going to be a session that's called How to Talanoa. It's on the Talanoa principle concept itself. And we're going to have young people from Fiji on here and um, talking about Talanoa, the concept. We would be very glad if any of you would join.